failed my 12th grade year for one class by one point, and they wouldn't let me graduate. For one point, that's why I dropped out. Where's that T-square at? Where's that T-square? I went all four years up until the last day of school, the day before graduation. And until this day, I think about it because maybe my life could have been different. That could have motivated me to go somewhere else to do something different. And that right there was kind of my breaking point, you know. It's like fuck it. That's that's literally what it is. It's just like fuck it. I don't I don't care. I don't have no. I don't have no motivation. I don't got nothing to live for. So like I started doing pills. I started being in the street. When I started getting to the streets, it was because you know I didn't feel like asking my mom for anything because it was kind of hard to because my mom um, at the time really didn't have a good job. You know, um, f divorced, and then when it came to around for graduation. That's when I was like, you know, deep in the streets. Man, this is what I want to do. This is what I, you know, I don't care. When I'm looking at my mom, it's like, you know, I can't ask you for nothing, so I got to fend for myself. Wilson Rivera is 25 yeah. and works as a carpenter's apprentice now. Yeah, yeah. But his story is still one that can be heard from countless black and Latino yeah, youth across three, Philly today. Three, Let down by a school three, system filled with students at the forefront of the city's disinvestment and cut off from an economy where they could have a better future. That's why many youth turn to the streets for survival and meaning, and as a result, fall into the city's cycle of gun violence. So that was the easiest thing for me as far as being a kid with no skills. You know, I can't go in to a job and make $30 an hour. You know, that's what I wanted. I wasn't content with five, six, seven dollars an hour. What can I do with that? I can't, I can't pay my rent with that, you know? I can't, I mean, I could, but I would have no life. Killing each other on a daily basis here. It's abnormal to live in a neighborhood where you see half of your friends die. Philly's gun violence has many roots as explored in previous episodes of the series, like policy. We are asking the court to declare these two firearm preemption laws unconstitutional. Mental health. I think when it comes to mental health and gun violence, I think something that we haven't unpacked is the intergenerational uh trauma that's passed down in culture it's like i don't want to take that oh like i don't want to get my ass whooped you feel me so i'm gonna pick up a gun so i ain't gonna take that ass whooped another major issue is the city's high poverty rate philadelphia has long been called the nation's poorest largest city and that label often unfortunately falls on the city's black and latino populations al dia spoke to larry eichel a senior advisor for pew philadelphia's research and policy initiative about the differences in median household income across different demographics. Median household income in 2019, which is really the last time we have uh, any good numbers, is about $47,500 you know, for one person. Um, you know, especially if that's a younger person, it doesn't sound so terrible. But, but you know, for a family, that's not a lot of money. For white non-Hispanic households, the median income was $70,000. For a black household, it was about $37,000. $37, and for Hispanic households, about thirty-two. dollars So the median for black and Hispanics was roughly half of what it was for white and non-Hispanic households. So you yeah. see, the difference is pretty clear. You probably need a wage of about $25 an hour or, or a little less uh, if you're working a 40 hour week, that's $52,000 a year. And that is defined as, as sort of the minimum for a family sustaining kind, kind of work. And as I said, over half the households in the city don't have incomes of $52,000 a year, or at least they didn't in 2019, the last data we had. So. That only got worse, especially for Black communities as the COVID-19 pandemic caused them to lose a disproportionate amount of jobs. And as economic turmoil set in, the city's gun violence shot through the roof. In the first year of the pandemic, Philly saw 499 homicides, up from the previous year. In 2021, with the city's economy still in recovery, it saw its worst year for homicides on record, with 562. A growing number of these homicides involved Black and Latino youth from homes that bear the brunt of economic struggle that has always been present, pandemic or not. The stress surrounding that situation shows when they get to school. To get a better idea of how that stress manifests itself, 
Alia spoke with Brandon Chastain, better known as B. McFly. He's a motivational speaker and Philly influencer. Like as a person that's fighting against gun violence, drug addiction, and mental health awareness, man, this is very disturbing because these kids are killing each other at a rapid rate. A lot of people have been affected by gun violence, whether they were in front of the gun, behind the gun, or not around the gun at all. A lot of people are hurting. A lot of people feel alone. So today is a day to let everybody know that we love each other, we're here for each other, let's come together. He is also a former long-term substitute in the school district of Philadelphia. Kids go to the outside resource. The outside resource is school, bottom line. That's where kids go. They go to eat, they go to sleep, they go to talk, right? They go to act immature because they got to be mature all day at home. Never know what they're going through at home. This kid is going to sleep every single day. That's a report. But you probably lost focus on this kid fighting every day. This kid smells every day. If we're all supposed to be um, reporters, right? Say you see somebody and they look like they're going through some type of neglect, you're supposed to report it. They're not doing that. Because that would be damn near the whole school. The whole school would be freaking reported. When I'm going to school as a kid and I'm not getting the resources that I need, man, after school, I'm going to go outside. And when I go outside, now it's on. I got to protect my name. I got to protect what I'm doing out here. And I'm faced with an identity crisis. I want to be like them. When you go to these schools, we got to make sure that we're impacting them with love, support. That's the most important part. Bringing some type of therapy to these schools because the shooters do go to school. The drug dealers do go to school. They may not stay in school all day, but that's nine times out of ten their first stop. Another way to keep youth more engaged at school and away from outside influences that can lead to gun violence is making sure they see themselves in school. That comes from both the curriculum they're taught and the teachers leading so the lessons. Two, inside. two dollars divided by five is 40 cents. For Akil Parker, an inclusive curriculum sits at the forefront of his approach to teaching math at his company, All This Math. We can create all this math just from the rap that we grew up listening to. So it's just another example of how we can meet people where they are and then bring them to where we want them to be. And this is kind of part of like, you know, my larger project of developing a framework called Histomatics. In between the four and the zero, yeah, that's good. With Histomatics, Parker draws a complementary line between math and history, so all in the effort to get black students more engaged in math. He is also a former Philadelphia public school teacher and currently a professor at Cheney University. Why is it important for students of color to see themselves in even their te textbooks, even when we're talking about just math? It makes you want to participate. You want to be able to see yourself in the content. You want to see yourself in the story. And now, but if you're constantly kind of told subtly that you're not in this story, this has nothing to do with you, then it's kind of like, well, why would I really want to be involved in something that has nothing to do with me? So I'm glad I realized the error in that. And I realized that that's what was going on. And I was able to change my approach and change my outlook, which is why, one, which is another reason why all this math exists in order to like teach kind of like what I consider like an African centered approach where like we're saying, okay, we're going to create word problems and math problems that like speak to the culture and the history of the students in the classroom. What is the effect on that when they don't see students or teachers that look like them? Well, you don't know how to talk to them. You don't, you can't have a dialogue. Even if they're not speaking, you should know how to read the body language and know how to get around that. I'm a great teacher. I passed, the, I passed everything, the practice test. I did these things. I did what I'm supposed to do. When it's time for me to educate, I'm a great teacher inside the classroom. But psychologically, are you great at understanding the culture? Do you know the language? Do you know the terms? Do you understand the body language of a kid that's, that's like suffering right now? No, that doesn't make you a bad teacher, but it's other things that professional development can't teach you. Bottom line, 
Black and brown men have to be there. When a black man is inside the school, the kids excel. Not because they're smarter than white men, it's because they know the culture and they're men. But I'm talking about when you're dealing with us, we need us to teach us. Only us can really get to us. Do you think you weren't understood because of the race of the administration? Or you didn't understand the culture? Or what do you think? It has to do kind of with both things because, like, you know, some people, you know, don't grow up that way. You know, like, the persona is that, you know, black kids and, you know, Hispanic kids, are, you know, they come from troubled homes. You know what I mean? Like, they don't come with no dads and stuff like that. But then again, it's like the administration doesn't know nothing what goes on at home. So you get what I'm saying? I and mean, a lot of the times the kids are told at home to be hiding stuff, you know, what's going on at home to the administration. So it's kind of hard for the administration to understand what's going on at home. You know what I mean? And even if, let's say, they do know. They don't come from that. They don't, they don't, they can't understand the situation. You know what I mean? It's like, how can you understand this kid and what he's been through if you've never been in that situation? You grow up privileged. You get what I'm saying? And I'm not to say that I didn't grow up privileged because I did grow up privileged. It was just that, you know, the things that went on around me kind of turned me into a different person. I had my parents in my life, but then again, I didn't. You know, they had their own problems, and I feel like, you know, they were too involved in themselves to even be involved with me, you know? So it was kind of like I was stuck between a, a, a rock and a hard, a hard place, you know what I mean? And how did, you know, like them treating you the way they treated you in school and then also like your home life affect your learning, your motivation in school? It's like you don't want to be there because you're like, I'm hated so much. Like, what's the purpose of me being here, you know? And I just wonder how all that, like, I guess, contributes to them being on the street or like turning to gun violence or whatnot. Like, what is that correlation, that relationship like? See, it's like... I'm living up to what their, their reputation, like uh, uh, this persona that they got. Like I said, I'm just what everybody said I was gonna be. You know what I mean? I'm always that that. It it kind of kills you on the inside because you're like, you've already got the story written out for you. You know what I'm saying? The number is the dividend. The second number is the division, and then you subtract. But even for those teachers that are there and get it, the situations they confront on a daily basis are often overwhelming. In all fairness, to teachers. It's very difficult to teach in many, you know, classrooms um, because you have students that, for various reasons, just are not prepared to learn or are not interested in learning on that particular day. And also, like the way the classes are rostered, maybe the class is overcrowded. Maybe there's too many students in the classroom. So the learning environment becomes inconducive. And then you get to the point where you have to make a decision. Do I just let the people that aren't as interested just sit in the back and not learn? Or do I put forth the energy to try to convince them and persuade them that this subject is of value? I think when you become more experienced in your career, you realize that everybody can't go. Because if you don't accept the fact that everybody can't go, what will happen is by you trying to create a situation where everybody can go, you'll cause harm to the people that are ready to go and actually want to go. I was a teacher, I became a, I was a substitute teacher. And every time I, every time I renewed my um, certificate and being a substitute teacher, I became a long-term sub. So you have substitute teachers that come in for a day or two or a week, however, when you become a long-term substitute teacher, that means that you're there for the duration of the year. It was a lot of teachers absent or gone in the Philadelphia School District. Why? <laughs> I don't, I, I, it's a lot, man. A lot of teachers don't relate. I'm not gonna lie to you, it might've became, a, it's like a norm. Like, here we go again, gotta do this gotta do that it's like you have some older teachers that are just norm to it it's like a norm to it yeah you're gonna have the kids doing the same stuff man acting up you got some teachers that can get with them and there's some teachers that just can't but the overall it's like the same and what does that say you know that so many you know teachers in the school district had to call out so many times is this problematic or i think it's it's very problematic it speaks to the environment within the within the schools um, it speaks to the level of preparation that the teachers have 
for the responsibilities that are placed upon them. We saw a lot of things. It's definitely a problem. But again, I don't I don't think it's accidental. I had students, you know, tell me that they haven't had a math teacher all year. Ask your child, do you have teachers every day? It's a good chance your child didn't have a teacher all year, but your child moved to the next grade level. When they say that your child is incompetent, they don't tell you, oh, well, they didn't have a teacher all year. So now when it's time to take a test, the kid don't know nothing. But how did they get to the 12th grade? And we're congratulations. We happy for you. You did it. You worked so hard. They really didn't. They just moved up. Given a struggle felt by both students and teachers in the classroom, achievement suffers when it comes to test scores. Did students meet the, like, the national like, criteria for test scores or whatnot? Not often. A lot of our black and brown kids are on a low level, a very, very low level. And they don't know how to test take. The anxiety levels of test taking, concentration of test taking, do's and don'ts before it's time to take a test. It's so much that come with that. So when it's time to take a test, they're not prepared to take a test. They never was prepared to take a test. Per school district of Philadelphia data between 2014 and 2019, the average percent of high school students scoring proficient or advanced on the statewide Keystone exam for Algebra 1 was 20%. For Biology, it was 26%. And for Literature, it was 42%. And how do students that do perform lower in school and or just don't have the motivation for school, what do those students' relationship to gun violence or being in the street like? It becomes more of an option, you know? It becomes like, I mean, the street, the street in and of itself becomes like an institution, you know? It provides a, a certain rites of passage. It provides like, you know, as unsafe as we understand it to be, it serves as a safe space, you know, for a lot of, for a lot of young people. And then you start to feel like, well, I need to learn how to succeed in this arena, in the street, in order to be a successful human being because that's my only option. So I need to sell drugs to be successful or I need to be a shooter to be successful. What has happened for a very long time is like education has been cheapened because we see the only purpose of education is just to get a job. It's not, for many people, it's not seen as a means to just become a more well-rounded human being to understand the world we live in and then hopefully be able to improve the world that we live in. Five. Five. At the heart of Parker's effort to bring value back to education is to show how math is transferable outside the classroom to many situations, including gun violence. So there are a lot of formulas, right, that you'll learn in mathematics classrooms that are applicable to, you know, daily situations. But also beyond the specific formulas, just the process of doing math problems and thinking about math problems and approaching them in a very methodical and systematic way is something that's very transferable. When you're encountered with a situation, a circumstance, a problem of your own, you may think it has nothing to do with mathematics. Your brain has been trained to think in a certain way. Because a lot of times if we're not trained to think in that way, then we end up defaulting to an emotional response. And oftentimes the emotional response is not the most healthy response. So the hope is that, you know, with math, it developing our what we call our critical thinking ability and apply it in all these different other situations that we're confronted with. Can I even go far as to say that math, teaching math is gun violence prevention? I believe so. I definitely believe so. There's a correlation between our, you know, our awareness, you know, our educational awareness, our future goals, our future prospects, and what we're doing, you know, when we're outside of the school. 16 years old, I'm in 11th grade. My plan is to go to college in two years. I'm probably gonna be less likely to put myself in a position to murder somebody with a gun because I know that the consequences of that may be that I will not be able to go to college. Once you start doing that, you start seeing the world differently. You start behaving differently. And a lot of the, a lot of the young people in Philadelphia and cities like it that are participants and the actors in gun violence, they'll stop, they'll stop being that because now they're thinking differently now. 
overarching all of the issues found within the school district of Philadelphia, from the overcrowded classrooms to the poor test scores, lacking curriculum and student support is also how it is chronically underfunded. Per the school district's 2021-2022 budget, its total operating budget for the year was $3.91 billion. $1.57 billion came from Pennsylvania, and $1.59 billion came from the city. A further $847 million came in federal grant. The Pennsylvania part of the school district's funding has long been scrutinized as not being enough, and it's why the state faced a trial earlier this year that could overhaul how it funds districts across the state. In the same article from the Philadelphia Inquirer, the school district's chief financial officer, Uri Monson, was quoted from the stand as saying the district spent the least in the state but had the highest need. That need is based on what each student needs to succeed in school. The state average of district spending per student is $13,688. In Philly, it's $10,796 per student. When looking at a district with a rigid tax base like Lower Marion, the amount spent per student was $26,362. The lack of financial support across the board sets Philadelphia youth back even further given that more students than in other districts come from distressed environments, and without extra support, those students cannot overcome their circumstances. To get a better look at how prepared Philly high schoolers are for college, Aldia met with Gilberto Gonzalez, an admissions counselor at the Community College of Philadelphia. A former student at the Community College back in the 80s, it gave him his career start, but he encounters many of the same problems he faced in the Philadelphia School District in the students he sees today coming to community college. High school, I was, I was not your, your valedictorian. I graduated uh, with a sixth grade reading level. I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't do math. From my personal experience, when I finally decided, you know, for, for many reasons, decided that the street just wasn't for me, and one of the things I learned very quickly is I need to learn how to read and write minimally, right? I need to learn how to communicate. Um, and I learned that here, right? But we're not taught that in high school. What are some areas that students are particularly lacking or, you know, they're not meeting certain expectations? So placement starts with the transcript. So usually the transcripts aren't what they should be, aren't college ready, so they have to take our placement test. When they take our placement test, then we realize what level of math and what level of English they are. And unfortunately, a lot of them need remedial. In conversations with these kids that aren't college ready, they really want to do it. They realize that, well, I should, why didn't my teacher talk? You know, why didn't they do this for me? In this particular position and just speaking to youth, it just kind of breaks my heart to see that we haven't, the school district hasn't changed much. Have you seen that, you know, uh, students or incoming students that come from better funded schools are tend to be more college ready? Yes, those kids are much better prepared for college. And most of those kids actually don't have to test. They can get in with just their tr high school transcripts. But, you know, schools that don't have the means and the support and the money invested in them, those kids tend to struggle. The reality is that their possibilities are a lot less. But even for those that attend community college, it can be hard to balance home life, just like in high school. So you got a kid that has to deal with the, the reality of home. They have to bring some money home. They have to work. They feel that pressure. You know, they're graduating high school. You know, I got to make money to help my mom pay the bills. I got to deal with substance abuse from a cousin, you know, like all this other stuff. And they come here like, I want to go to school part time. It's like, yeah, you can do that, but then your financial aid is smaller, right? And there's some scholarships that you have to be a full-time student. So they're like, well, how the hell am I going to juggle all this? So some kids, take, they were like, okay, this is doable. And unfortunately, other kids are like, no, I can't, I can't do this. I, I need a job right now. When they find out those jobs that just require a high school degree, they're not high earning, what can happen then after that. For kids coming from North Philly, if they're making $15 an hour and that's all, that's their expectation, that's the best they could do, guess what they're gonna do? To feed their families, to, to, to get that car, to get those expensive shoes. They're, they're gonna do what they need to do to get it. Is there a relationship between those students and gun violence or being in the street? The kids that I get to speak to at the schools, they're lucky, right? 
I mean, that's, I'm just being honest, because there are a bunch of other kids we can't reach, we can't get to. Nothing has changed. I mean, gun violence has always been in, in part of our, our community. So for those kids we can't reach, we've never been able to tell them about the possibilities, right? That opens up a huge door for you, right? But we need to be, have access to them. And a lot of time we don't have access. For those that don't go to college, good paying jobs can be hard to come by in Philadelphia's economy. Considering that 66% of jobs in Philadelphia as of 2021 require at least a bachelor's degree. Approximately 31% of Philadelphians have that level of education as of 2019. It leaves entrepreneurship as another option for young people to pursue a more prosperous future out of the street. However, that too can come with many obstacles. President of the West Philadelphia Corridor Collaborative, Jabari Jones, interacts daily with entrepreneurs and small businesses, and he provides them support they often don't get from the government. We have to eliminate bureaucracy. Um, and that's a hard thing that people don't, probably doesn't hate to hear that, but the reality is it is really complicated to do simple things in a city. It should be super easy to run a business in a city and be compliant with city laws without hiring somebody who's charging you $75 to $100 an hour you know, to navigate the stuff for you. Like, I think honestly, and, and if you really want to make a super strong business community, your license, you should make licensure free. But again, and this is the other thing I think that is this city has had, the city has been prioritizing its revenue base over, you know, having more successful restaurants that are gonna hire people or over other types of heavily licensed or heavily regulated industries. On top of the bureaucracy, Jones also helps his local businesses cope with gun violence they see in their communities, which also affects their bottom lines. The Safe Corridors is a grant that's available for residents and small businesses anywhere in West Philadelphia, but we're going to be targeting the areas that are the highest crime communities to receive a free high-grade security camera, um, and we're funding the installation, the actual device, as well as a three-year warranty on the camera. And hopefully that will eventually inspire our companies and encourage our companies to stay open later where they're able to generate more in revenue. One of the things that's universal across our district is you see businesses are closing before nightfall across the entire city in neighborhoods. Um, and it's no different here in West Philly. We have businesses that are losing between three and five hours each day. They could be using to generate revenue, generate profit, and be able to sell their products and services. And they just aren't able to because they don't feel safe. One of those businesses is Amatullah's Treasures on Lansdowne Avenue. It's run by Atia Havens. Amatullah's Treasures is a woman's boutique that specializes in modest attire for all women. This is your first time having cameras outside of your business? Most definitely. And you've had this business for 10 years? Yes. Wow. It's been a prayer. <laughs> it's been a prayer. Um, and as people have told me, they're like, you know, you really need to. And I'm like, you know how expensive cameras are and maintenance and just all of those different things, especially if you want to get something that will really benefit not just the you know the home i can see a, a black blur so to speak mm -hmm. where you can actually see the person i pray nothing ever happens to my business but to have that sense of security is just amazing do you think other businesses in west philly or any part of philly at all they also are in similar positions to you most definitely most definitely uh, be it cameras inside and or outside definitely um outside things have changed to not being as safe as it used to be. What else do you think the city can do to help small businesses when it comes to gun violence? Jobs. There's nothing, you know. Getting a job that allows you to actually live and support your family, that's what young people need. They need that and we don't really, we don't supply it as much as we should. Why is investing in small businesses slash businesses that are not in downtown Philadelphia preventing gun violence? Our businesses are 85% more likely to hire locally than regional corporate chains franchises, right? And so what, when you, again, hire locally, what you end up doing is you are providing financial opportunities to some of these same individuals. So you, you can get people, again, that $50,000 worth benefits. It doesn't need to be the most you know amazing salary package, but you should be able to pay your bills, take care of your house, go on one vacation a year, right? And you get that by investing in businesses that have the capacity to hire and be sustainable. Um, and you know that the businesses that are in neighborhoods are 85% more likely to hire locally versus a lot of those downtown major corporations who they don't care where the town comes from. They have folks from Jersey working down there. But if you change that dynamic by having job creating companies that are creating that fifty thousand dollars or more than that plus benefits, and your community starts to change, you can now change the makeup of businesses. Limited by college options and job credentials, 
many Philly youth feel without options regarding their future. However, another option some see can find success in is in the trades. Sylvia Ocasio is the program manager of Project Wow at Jeb's Human Services. There, Philadelphia youth obtain their GEDs and can get certified in any number of building trades to start their careers. We give young adults ages 18 to 24 an opportunity to come back to school to obtain a high school diploma, but to also learn a skill in the trades. What they want to leave behind is failure. What they want to leave behind is what didn't work. What they want to leave behind is that their lives weren't working because they didn't do what they were supposed to do to succeed. That's the kitchenette for employee lounge, employee lounge actually. One of those young people who wanted to leave their lives behind was Wilson, caught in the cycle of Philly's poor education system and job market until he found purpose in Project WOW. After I got locked up, I'm just like, what am I gonna do? You know, and that's when I decided to go to my GED program, you know. I need to develop some type of skills because I can't make it out here, you know, as a felon. I was on house arrest, so I was very limited on what I could do. And I was just a lost kid, so, you know, finding Project Well wow, kind of changed my life. And I don't got to turn to the streets for nothing. So that's what the problem is. A lot of the kids, they have no skills to do anything, so they turn to the streets. And, you know, the streets drag you in, and that, once you're in the streets, it's hard to get out. I give up all the money in the street right now to do what I do now, you know what I mean? I don't care about nothing like that anymore. It's, it's a totally different ball game now because, you know, I got kids to live for. And I learned that the hard way, you know. I proved them right. So now, at the end of the day, I'm sitting here in a jail cell by myself, with nobody to back me, you know what I'm saying? When, when in reality, all I needed was myself to believe in myself.